Good evening and welcome to Capital Connection, where we join the dots to give you the big picture for business in Africa. I'm Arnold Segawa. On the agenda, we talk fishing, both along Africa's uh, more than 30,000 kilometers of a coastline and within its extensive network of freshwater lakes and rivers. While in South Africa, a government is proposing a new energy mix that uh, leans towards private power producers. And uh, in the commodity corner, it's all about gold and whether the bearish sentiment towards the precious metal is set to undergo a sea change. In a report from Rwanda, we take a look at uh, the economics of coffee. But before all of this, uh, South Africa's inquiry into a large-scale corruption under the former president Jacob Zuma's administration is entering its second week. CNBC Africa's uh, correspondent and political analyst uh, Karabal Itlatha is uh, at the State Capture Judicial Commission inquiry and joins us for more. Karabal? It might still be too early in the game to tell in the life of this commission. As you know, today represents day four of the state of capture inquiry and witnesses have been lining up, but so too have been those that deny those allegations. Right now, President Zuma must be a worried man and it's actually disconcerting that he's not among the people who've applied to cross-examine some of the testimony and witnesses that have stood here in front of this commission. What is being alleged really is giving paid to all the rumors and all the stories we heard leading up from 2010. About eight years of insinuations were made as to the powers that the Gupta brothers, through extension of the president, former president Jacob Zuma, actually occupy in government. And today, Feiki Mantua, who is a former ANC MP, really spent the better part of her morning trying to ascertain to us how it all came about. And for her, the crux was really a trip that she took towards the end of August in 2010, when she asked uh, asked one of the state-owned entities, Transnet, to pay for her trip, since it was outside of her parliamentary duties, to go to China. And it turns out that the president was also en route to China and that his, the president, that is former President Jacob Zuma, his would be a state visit to China. That was the beginning of Feige Mentor's introduction, if you will, to the Gupta brothers. But familiar names, of course, came into play. Names like the president's, from the former president's son, Duduzani Zuma. He was the one who actually went to her cubicle in her first class Emirates flight on her way to Shanghai and introduced himself as Dudu Zanizuma, the son of the former president, and he introduced others as well. And it seems that was the beginning of their relationship. She really went into lengths trying to explain that she didn't really trust the persona of President Jacob Zuma, that even because she had been trying so hard to get an interview, uh, to get a sit down rather with the former president, Mr. Jacob Zuma, that it was really odd to her that it's only when she got to Shanghai that her wish was being granted. But there was a conduit. The conduit was one of the Gupta brothers. As she says, she was battling at the beginning to really differentiate who is who between the brothers that she didn't know them. That She went into, into all kinds of explanations as to how her mind made her remember who is who within the brothers, that she ultimately had to separate them through age and through uh, body physique. She spoke about uh, separating the brothers through obesity, which was a moment that... Uh, was kind of soft on on some of the people in attendance of the court today but really she was going into that detail that leads up to the offer that she says she received from one of the Gupta brothers at the Saxon World Compound while the president was in the adjacent room. She says that President Jacob Zuma was in the adjacent room and was not there when the offer was made and will only be getting to that part of the story tomorrow. Because today there was a lot of information that was dished out. This information was not necessarily helpful to the case. I mean, it included things like windows of the Gupta Saxon World House. It, she spoke about pillars, spoke about paintings and wallpaper and, and one could you know, just generally wanted to hurry her on, considering that former Deputy Finance Minister MKBC Jonas was really up and done before we even went to lunch. And hers is a testimony that really centers around one story and one offer. It's not as persistent as we had seen in the case of former Deputy Finance Minister MKBC Jonas. So really, the walls are closing in on President Jacob Zuma, but I think as the chess player that he is, he will bide his time. He will actually see just how much evidence that this commission 
information can corroborate how much evidence will stick to him before he jumps up and actually fosters a, a rebuttal towards any of the things that have been said about him. But from the sounds of things, it sounds like the president had taken a backseat, if you will, from his executive duties and executive powers, and he had, at least for a matter of years, handed them over to the Gupta brothers. So the walls are closing in, and I expect that the president will be even following these hearings even more concentrated in what people are saying about him because that will forever remain part of his legacy. Arnold? Many thanks for that, Garabo. Now, uh, let's talk some coffee. Each day across the world, more than two billion cups of coffee are drunk. South America is the largest producer of uh, the, the bean, uh, but the home of the coffee happens to be in Africa. Coffee bean connoisseurs uh, view the quality of random coffee as superior to that produced in Zimbabwe and Zambia, but not yet in the League of Kenya or even Tanzania, Michael Mugisha reports. Now you might be wondering, why so much fuss about coffee? Well, it's simple. Coffee is one of Rwanda's top foreign exchange earners, bringing in close to $60 million annually. Now, we might give you the numbers and leave it just there, but the story goes far beyond just the export markets to how the crop is helping people live better lives. Elias Hachizamungu lives in Mutenderi sector in Goma district. Now, that's more than 100 kilometers away from Kigali. He grows coffee on up to two hectares of land with close to 9,000 trees. We drove east from the capital to connect the dots. I have 9,000 coffee trees, but I have a piece of land cleared and ready for more coffee. I want to have at least 15,000 trees by the end of the season. These trees do not work themselves, so I have hired people to work the plantation, cover the trees with grass, and when the coffee berries are ripe, there's some people pick them. Now from last year's harvest, I've managed to buy myself a 3 million Toyota Corolla and send my children to school. I have medical insurance and live a better life off of my coffee fam. Elias Coffee, just like any other farmer in Rwanda, ends up on wide load tracks to Kigali. In the capital, it is cleaned, roasted, and packaged for export. Uh, when we started in 2009, we focused on producing what's called fully washed coffee. We started to invest in coffee washing stations, uh, investing in farmer agronomy uh, so that we could produce a higher quality product. Uh, when we started, we were quite small. Today, we export about 10 and a half million pounds of fully washed coffee. Our pricing is not so much determined by what other countries and what the global price is doing. Um, but we have to be able to produce that kind of quality in, in high volume. Letter statistics shows that Rwanda exported 23,000 tons of coffee in 2017 only. The country is looking at a 1,500 increase to hit 24,500 tons by 2018. But where does the rest of the coffee go? Smells like heaven in a cup. Now, uh, one takeaway from all of this is that, on average, a cup of coffee goes for 2 to $3 in Kigali. But tens of thousands of jobs have been created along the value chain. Back to you, Johannesburg, as I have a cup of coffee to take care of. Now, the gold price has been wallowing in a narrow range with the recent times showing that uh, the price remains firmly in the grasp of the bears. But are the bulls about to start running with gold? Joining us to discuss the gold prospects is uh, Patrick Mathindi, uh, who is an analyst with uh, the independent black-owned investment management company, Alwani Capital Partners. Uh, many thanks for making time to speak to us uh, today, Patrick. Uh, terrible in times, without a doubt. Often uh, with such volatility in the market, one would have thought someone would have gone for gold, you know, safe haven, well, on paper at least. Uh, what do you say to this notion? Look, I mean, there has been a little bit of an uptick in the gold price. So for the better part of the last few weeks, it was around $1,000 an ounce, uh, you know, and then it has spiked to about 1200 
But if you look at the long term, uh, certainly the, the gold price has not been uh, sort of a store of wealth as uh, people tend to think of it. It tends to come on its own during times of uncertainty, times of high volatility. And as I mentioned, we've seen a little bit of that uh, with, uh, with the Turkish lira, uh, with uh, what's, what was happening then in, 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 uh, in, in Turkey. But also uh, with uh, the other emerging markets, sort of um, uh, volatility around the interest rates normalization of the US. So in that scenario, uh, where people are looking for some uh, sort of a place to hide, so to speak, uh, it, it can be defensive. And I think this explains the last few sessions. But long term, I think the last time the gold price was at its high was 2001 at about $600. And, and and prior to that, you know, six hundred dollars, yeah, sixteen hundred, sixteen hundred, one thousand six hundred years, and that was just after the nine eleven uh, you know, terrorist attack. After that, it went all the way down to about four hundred uh, to to recover to where it is now, you know, around twelve hundred. So, in inflation-adjusted terms, uh, certainly the gold price cannot be seen as a store of wealth. You know, it, it, it gives you no yield, so you don't earn any dividends or interest rates out of it, mm. and it really comes to its own during times of uncertainty where. In global financial markets, whether that uncertainty is driven by political uncertainty, as we've seen with the trade wars, yeah. or so some dislocation in financial markets, then you can sort of hide in there. But net net is not. Uh, Patrick, uh, there's been this idea. Well, yeah. monetary policy has evolved over the years. Uh, New Zealand, 1999, introducing inflation targeting. And sure. fast forward to where we are right now, uh, gold is no longer uh, backing uh, yes. uh, 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 currency as yes. it is and fiat yeah. money. Yeah. Do you get the sense that this evolution of monetary policy away from uh, the gold standard uh, towards Bretton Woods and now the standard that we have right now has seen gold lose its value? Well, its uh, 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 appearance, to, should I say? Look, uh, absolutely, uh, because you know one of the things that works against gold, uh, unfortunately, is the mere fact that it simply does not stay up you know, with the true value of money. Mm -hmm. So you can see this, the dislocation between the currencies themselves and what the gold price does. And part of it is simply because there is a lot more of the gold sitting in vaults as around central banks around the world uh, than there is on the ground. So, so it, it, it kind of loses its allure, so to speak. And, and, and the economies and the financial markets in global terms have become so sophisticated that gold on its own, you know, it's not a good proxy anymore of, of, of the store of, value of money. Patrick, many thanks for uh, making time to speak to us. Uh, let's take a short break, but uh, coming up before the, after the break rather, uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, fishing and uh, South Africa's policy shift towards renewable energy as part of a more diverse energy mix for the country. Uh, all that and more after the break. Welcome back to our Capital Connection. Now, the majority of people in Africa receive their protein needs from fish. But are Africa's uh, governments protecting the maritime resource from overfishing and also ensuring the fresh water systems are not poisoned by industrial and agricultural waste or any other pollutants? Joining us uh, is the South African Institute of International Affairs Head of Governance and Resources, Alex uh, Bankenstein. Uh, Alex, uh, fishing is a vital resource for a majority of the people on the continent, without a doubt. Do you get the sense that African governments actually do give it the attention it deserves? Undoubtedly, as you've said in your introductory remarks, uh, fish is a crucial source of protein for um, African communities, uh, not only in the coastal areas, but throughout, relying on marine and freshwater resources. I would say generally there has been in the past few years uh, very much an increased awareness of the importance of appropriate fisheries governance and to an extent a greater investment in improving fisheries resources. That being said, there are still very serious challenges related to environmental governance, uh, illegal fisheries, and, and generally overfishing of, of, um, of the available resources. 
Alex, let's uh, talk about uh, the artificial art of uh, fishing that has come to the centerfold here across the continent and of course across the globe. Um, with the exception of Egypt and maybe uh, South Africa and, well, emerging Kenya, uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa has just failed to uh, embrace the modern day art of fishing. Do you, what could be the prescription here? Well, generally it, it's, it's been a capacity issue. Um, in, in terms of developing uh, industrial fisheries, the approach has often of African governments has often been to enter into agreements with foreign uh, fishing fleets um, in exchange for access to the fisheries resources. African governments uh, then get a degree of uh, foreign exchange. Certainly, there's a sense that. That needs to be, uh, needs to change. That's not a satisfactory solution. Certainly, we've got large, small-scale fisheries uh, populations, fisheries communities, all along our coastline, and there's a sense that uh, African countries and African citizens really have to benefit far more from the full value chain of actually engaging in the fisheries. So just entering into agreement with, with uh, foreign, foreign nations to fish our waters uh, is not an adequate solution. Alex, uh, I want to draw you to a, a, a very fascinating example of uh, really obliviousness when it comes to uh, many politicians in the 70s in East Africa when uh, one Idi Amin got the Nile perch and uh, took it to uh, Lake Victoria, which is the biggest uh, freshwater lake in the country and Africa. Uh, oblivious to the fact that uh, it's actually carnivorous and it feeds on itself and uh, other species. To, to what extent is this actually uh, uh, contributing to the depletion of uh, fish across uh, uh, many of our freshwater lakes? Well, you've touched on a very interesting example there. Um, yes, it's absolutely true. The introduction of Nile perch into uh, Lake Victoria in particular um, has led from an ecological perspective, uh, certainly it's been a disaster. Um, many indigenous fish species in that system have been under pressure. Nile perch, of course, is an African fish species, but it was not indigenous to the Lake Victoria system. So a lot of damage was done there. On the other side, it is uh, a large fish which produces a product for which there is international demand. And it's become an important source of, of cash revenue for um, huge numbers of uh, fishers um, from Tanzania, from Uganda, from Kenya. So there's an important socioeconomic angle to this where there has been strong benefits. Um, it is an interesting case, and there are a lot of complex um, dynamics related to that sector, which we probably can't go into now. Um, I would say that broadly, yes, the introduction of species into new systems that damage, yes, it is a concern um, in most systems outside, I'd say, of Lake Victoria, perhaps. Um, I would not say that that's the key problem. The key problem in many of these systems uh, remains overfishing uh, and then environmental degradation. You mentioned the issue of uh, polluted uh, rivers, um, also agricultural runoff, uh, making very rich, um, nutrient-rich waters, resulting in algal blooms. It depletes oxygen, and that's very harmful for the fisheries resources. So again, as I said, a whole set of, of challenges really uh, facing our fish resources and also our fishing communities. Many thanks for that, Alex. Now, in a few short months, South Africa has moved from uh, plans to build a brand new nuclear energy plant at the cost of hundreds of billions of US dollars to an energy mix that excludes nuclear and includes renewable energy as one of its pillars. Joining us now is an independent uh, energy analyst, Chris Yelland. Uh, Chris, many thanks for making time to speak to us. Last year, it was all about nuclear energy, and uh, fast forward uh, to 2018, we're talking renewable energy and uh, independent power producers. Quite erratic, if you ask me. Well, you see, the thing is that the world is changing as we speak. Uh, this uh, nuclear plan has been on the drawing board since 2008, 
And during the period of 2008 to now, there have been a really very significant changes, both in the demand for electricity, which has essentially uh, not been growing since 2008, uh, which is in complete contradiction with all the planning assumptions that were made previously. And at the same time, the price of new uh, renewable energy uh, has been declining sharply over this period, uh, making the business case for nuclear uh, less and less attractive. Uh, so the IRP, uh, the Integrated Resource Plan that we see released today for public comment, has really removed nuclear power from the table until at least 2030. And in the meantime, uh, the matter is going to be studied further to try and look more carefully uh, at the uh, implications for South Africa of a very expensive uh, nuclear new build. All right, uh, Chris, one thing that's quite fascinating is uh, just at the, the BRICS summit just a few weeks ago, well, just over a month, uh, we did get a nuance about uh, whether or not there is a commitment uh, from South Africa to contract the, 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 the Russian uh, nuclear dealers uh, to have a plant set up here. Does this hold any water per se? Were there commitments to start with? Well, the first thing to say is that there was a nuclear intergovernmental cooperation agreement uh, between the South African government and a number of uh, nuclear vendor countries, including uh, the uh, country that was really in the prime sort of position uh, for a nuclear new build in South Africa, which is Russia. Uh, so there was an agreement between Russia and South Africa, an intergovernmental cooperation agreement, which kind of committed South Africa certainly to prefer the Russian uh, nuclear reactor technology. However, uh, in uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, at the beginning of this year, a court uh, judgment uh, in the Cape Town High Court set aside this uh, nuclear intergovernmental agreement with Russia, amongst other countries, as being uh, unlawful and unconstitutional. Uh, that has been the situation uh, since February this year. Uh, yes, and you're right, uh, President Putin raised the matter at a recent uh, BRICS uh, conference in South Africa uh, and was asking what is happening to this nuclear build, which I think uh, was putting uh, South Africa under pressure uh, unfairly because uh, Mr. Putin knows very, very well that that agreement that was signed was subject to the laws of South Africa and a court of law has set that agreement aside and declared it unlawful and unconstitutional. So I think it was very disingenuous uh, of President Putin to raise this matter in the way he did uh, at, uh, at the BRICS summit, which was, seemed to be intended to uh, put the new president of South Africa, President Ramaphosa, on a spot and embarrass him when he knew full well the answer. Chris, uh, fascinating stuff indeed. Uh, let, let's look at uh, what the grid uh, is going to look like by 2030, at least the plans that have been put forward. Uh, 34,000 megawatts uh, coming from coal, uh, 11,930 megawatts coming from gas. Now, 80% of uh, the, 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 w the generated uh, electricity here in the country is coming, uh, energy should I say, is coming from coal alone. Isn't this overly ambitious? Well, um, the situation really is that uh, the ambitions of South Africa for new generation capacity uh, has been significantly uh, toned down in this new draft integrated resource plan for electricity, primarily because uh, the projected demand for electricity in the years ahead uh, has uh, reduced uh, and uh, South Africa is projecting less growth and less uh, demand for electricity uh, as the economy has been rather slow, number one, and number two, the energy intensity of South Africa, that means the amount of electricity needed to generate a unit of gross domestic product, of GDP. The energy intensity of South Africa has been declining, reducing, so that the need for new energy in South Africa has, it has been reducing compared to our aspirations in 2010, which is when the last integrated resource plan for electricity was done. So uh, certainly it's not as ambitious in terms of new build as it was in, in 2010. Uh, and, and things have been scaled back significantly. And most importantly, no more nuclear to 2030 and no more new Eskom coal-fired power stations to 2030 beyond the existing project of Madupi and Kusili. There has been an allowance or an allocation of 1,000 megawatts is relatively small for new coal independent power producers. 
so uh, I, I would not say it's overly ambitious. If anything, I think it's more realistic this time round. Chris, uh, let's talk about the other country in the picture here, which is Mozambique. Now, uh, just last week, I was speaking to uh, the Sasol uh, uh, joint CEO, uh, uh, Mr. Wababa, and what he mentioned was the the reliance on, on the, the, the gas uh, reserves that were found in Mozambique have a lot of potential here. And for many of the outlooks when it comes to electricity generation come 2030, there's a huge reliance on Mozambique. For a country as industrialized as South Africa, how much risk does this pose, if at all, your electricity as an industrialized country is coming from across the border? The way to mitigate risk is to diversify both the uh, number of generators as well as the number of primary energy sources. And one of the ways of doing this is to uh, move towards gas as a filler uh, in, 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 and as a backup uh, to uh, intermittent renewable energy sources such as wind and solar PV. So yes, we will be reliant on imported liquefied natural gas or imported piped gas from our neighbors uh, right. because at this time, South Africa does not have uh, findings of uh, significant gas in its own uh, territories. Uh, but uh, the, the, the good thing to note is that the amount of gas needed as a filler for wind and and nuclear, uh, sorry, for wind and, and uh, solar PV is not that significant. Uh, it's really uh, a filler. Uh, one needs to have significant capacity, but one doesn't need to have significant volumes of gas. Right. Uh, and, you know, we are already heavily dependent for our entire transportation industry on imported uh, oil, crude oil, uh, diesel, uh, and, and refined uh, petroleum products. Uh, so uh, it's nothing new that South Africa imports a significant part of its uh, energy needs in terms of uh, liquid fuels. Uh, and in fact, the amount of gas required as a filler for renewable energy, that is wind and solar PV, is actually not a lot of gas. Many thanks for that, Chris. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time that uh, we did have for today's conversation. Fascinating stuff indeed. Uh, that was uh, Chris Yelland. Uh, do join us again next Wednesday at uh, 6.30 p.m. Central African time where Brexit and the possible trade benefits will be on the menu.